Okay, let's get to the Word of God. Ephesians uh, chapter 1, we're going to begin at the very beginning here. Uh, but before we jump into the text, I was reading a story this week from October in 2018 when a lady uh, in Orlando, Florida, you know all buck wild stories start with someone in Florida, right? You ever heard the Google thing where you can type in Florida man and then just see what comes up and it's like the wild west of existence? Uh, in October 2018, a, a lady boarded a Frontier Airlines flight, first mistake, flying Frontier. She boarded a Frontier uh, Airlines flight, and when she had booked her ticket, she had indicated that she had an emotional support animal, right? Normal, fine, everything's good. So she, she, she has the little, uh, the little cage thing, and she clears TSA, she makes it to the gate, she gets on the flight, and the flight attendants came to discover that she had failed to inform anybody at any point in this process that this uh, emotional support animal was an emotional support squirrel. <laughs> this is a real story. You can Google it. Don't do it right now. This is an emotional support squirrel. And so as you might imagine, the flight attendants are coming over to her and saying, excuse me, ma'am, there will be no flying squirrels today. Okay? Like this is not going to fly. You cannot have a squirrel on this plane. That's not allowed. And she... Like the worst kind of person, she put up a total ruckus. She refused to leave the flight. She refused to leave the animal. And so she made every single other person deplane and the police get involved. Now, here's the question I was asking as I was, listening, as I was like reading this story. I, I was asking myself this question. What in the world makes somebody think that they are entitled to bring a rodent on an airplane? And then why would you like double down and stand your ground and assert your rights and say, no, I'm doing this? Why? Why is that? And I think it's because of something in our culture, which is this, that we are obsessed with what we deserve. We're obsessed with our rights, with what we are entitled to, with what we are owed in fact, in some ways, our country and our culture is built on this idea that we have rights. And are there good things about that? Yes, of course there are. Is there truth there? Yes, of course there is. But in a culture that is obsessed with what we deserve and what we can earn and what is our right, we are going to find that the book of Ephesians will be a little bit offensive to us because the book of Ephesians is about what we could never earn and do not deserve. The book of Ephesians is all about grace. It's all about the grace of God, the undeserved, lavish favor that he has given to those who belong to him, that they could have never merited of their own accord, and they do not deserve, but he gives it anyways. The book of Ephesians is all about the opposite of rights. In the economy of God, if you get what you deserve, that is bad news. But praise be to God, we have a king who gives grace. This letter, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, is all about the riches of that grace. And what we're going to see for the next several months as we dive into this letter, we are going to explore that grace and unpack that grace and understand that grace. And we're going to see, even in the coming weeks, the intended response of God's people to that grace, which is to give praise to the one who distributes it. That we are intended to worship God to the praise of his glorious grace. And as we begin this letter, as Paul writes his little salutation in just the first two verses, which is what we're going to cover today, we need to understand this. Paul wants us to know that grace is coming. Paul wants us to know that grace is coming. As Paul begins the letter, he wants us to anticipate that the core contents of the letter are going to be all about the grace that God delivers to us in Jesus Christ and what he's done on our behalf. We're going to see today this big idea play out. The letter to the Ephesians causes God's people to anticipate grace. The letter to the Ephesians it causes God's people, as we read it and understand it, with the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit to illuminate our eyes and to renew our minds. What we're going to see is that the letter to the Ephesians causes us to anticipate that grace is coming from God. 
There are all kinds of things I'm sure that we have come to expect from God. Some of them good, some of them bad, some of them misinformed, some of them ill-informed. And yet what we'll learn from the letter to the Ephesians today in just the first two verses is that what we should anticipate from God as his people is we should anticipate grace. We should anticipate his undeserved kindness and favor to us. We're just going to cover the first two verses in what forms the introduction to this letter. But as we do, what you're going to see is that it will surface some of the major themes that we'll encounter all the way through the letter. This is how the letter to the Ephesians begins. Verse 1, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm excited to dive into this with you because if you're like me, sometimes when you read your Bible and you open up to a new book, you take this little section and you're like, okay, let's just move on to the good stuff. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Like, you skip over the intro, let's get to the real thing in the letter. But I am excited today because there's actually, there's goodness here. There's glory here that we need to stop for just a moment and dig into before we launch off into the rest of this book. We actually need to understand why Paul began this way, a familiar way that he begins his letter. And so the question we're going to ask in response to that big idea is why should we anticipate grace? Through the letter to the Ephesians and from the Holy Spirit and the pen of the Apostle Paul, why is it that God's people should anticipate grace through this letter? Well, I want to give you three reasons to anticipate grace. The first one is this. We anticipate grace because of the role of the writer. We anticipate grace because of the role of the writer. He was sent by Christ. Sent by Christ. This is what Paul tells us at the very, very beginning of this letter. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, this is Paul, who formerly was Saul. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll know the conversion story of Saul. He was breathing threats and murder against the followers of the way, the scripture says. He was, on, he was actually physically on his way, on the road to Damascus, to go and imprison and execute and murder and persecute believers in Jesus Christ. He had official papers from the Sanhedrin to go and persecute Christians, and he's on his way, and he gets knocked off his horse by the risen Lord Jesus, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in this dramatic moment of miraculous conversion, Paul is transformed from somebody who once hated and opposed Christians to now he's a full-on church planter. He's struck blind for a couple days, and then he goes into the city, and he's relieved of his blindness by somebody who's kind of afraid that he is there because he's a Christian, and he knows this guy murders Christians. But then Paul is commissioned by the Spirit taught personally by the Lord Jesus Christ and sent as the apostle to the Gentiles to plant churches in the entire known world in that region. And he went in the power of the Spirit to do just that. And he describes himself, this is Paul, whose name was once Saul, named after the biggest, baddest looking king in the the Old Testament, right? The very first king that God chose because of his impressive physical stature. And then his name was changed to Paul, which literally means small. He went from Saul to Paul. He got humbled by God, forgiven, transformed, renewed, commissioned, sent. His life was completely transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And now he says the primary things he claims to himself, he says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. The word apostle means a one, one who is sent. Paul says, I have been sent by the risen Lord Jesus. This is, this, is my, this is my job. This is my title. This is who I am. I am sent by Jesus Christ. One of the amazing things about Paul's story is that even after Jesus had risen from the grave and then commissioned his disciples and even ascended into heaven, the risen Lord Jesus appeared to the apostle Paul and personally instructed him in the gospel. This is why Paul actually calls himself, he calls himself the apostle out of time. Because there was, there was 11 other apostles, 12 minus 1 Judas, and he was the apostle out of time. Because the risen Lord Jesus appeared to him afterwards and personally told him about the gospel and who he was and his kingdom and his mission to the world. And he commissioned Paul to go and to preach this gospel. 
So Paul says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. I was personally taught and commissioned and sent by him. And he says, make no mistake, I didn't interview for that job. Make no mistake, I didn't earn that job with my oratory skills. I didn't have the right resume on LinkedIn and I sent it to the right person and then we connected on Indeed and then I went for an interview and I squared it all away and I got the job of apostle. That's not how it happened. In fact, Paul would take great pains to tell you that it was not his initiative in any way that made him who he is. It was by the will of God. You're like, Paul, why are you an apostle? Because God wanted me to be. I don't know. God chose me, called me, set me apart, saved me, and then sent me to write this letter to you as an instrument of grace. This is who Paul is, by the will of God. Even in just that little phrase, we're going to see even in the coming weeks that the will of God and the plan of God is the master authority of God's sovereignty that sits over all of his salvation and over all of his grace. Paul is going to take great pains to help us know that it is not by our will, not by our works, not by our merit, but by the will and grace of God. I'm an apostle. I'm a sent one by the will of God. The the way that you receive a message, or maybe more specifically, who delivers the message changes completely how you receive it. How the message is delivered and who delivers the message changes the way that you receive the message. You know that rule, which I don't know who made this rule, but you know the rule that like you only have to pay a traffic ticket if someone serves it to you in person? <laughs> Do you know that rule? Or did I make that rule up? If I'm going to jail, just let me know afterwards. Um, <laughs> You know how like the, the people will be like sneaky and they'll try to like serve you the ticket? I, I got, this was probably like a year, year and a half ago, I got utterly and absolutely duped on my own driveway one time. <laughs> Apparently, I had been in Paradise Valley like a month before or something on the way to the dentist and I was, you know, speeding, forgive me, and <laughs> I, I'm, I, I got flashed by the, flashed by the, the light, the camera, and then this guy showed up on my driveway like a month later, and he goes, he goes, hey, um, are, you, are you Nick? And I was like, yeah. And the reason, I mean, I don't know what I would have said otherwise, but the dude was wearing, straight up, he was wearing that iconic Amazon blue vest. Now, it didn't say Amazon on it, but he had a full-on Amazon blue vest, and he walks up with like a little envelope in his hands. He goes, are you Nick? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, wha-bam, here you go. And he hands me this thing, and I was like, did I just get Amazon tricked by this guy? He's like posing as an Amazon driver, and he's serving me a traffic ticket, and then I was obligated to pay it. The, the reason I'm saying that is because the way you receive communication, the way you receive a message totally depends on who delivers it. And here's what I mean. If you're driving down Camelback Road when you leave this service, and a mall cop in a golf cart tries to pull you over, you're going to be like, what are you talking about? You don't have jurisdiction. This isn't the Metro Center. This is Camelback. But if a police officer in a uniform and a cruiser flashes the lights, you're pulling over to the side of the road because who delivers the message? It changes the way that you receive it. And Paul was personally commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to write this letter of grace to you. And here's what I want you to know. You and I, even all these years later and all this distance removed, because we belong to the people of God, this is not just an antiquated, outdated, and irrelevant letter that was for some people somewhere a long time ago. This is for you and me if we are in Christ. The reason we can anticipate grace is because this letter, the, the role of its writer was personally sent by Jesus Christ. And so because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, delivered through apostolic authority, this letter and its contents are for us here right now. And so we can anticipate as we study it and as we unpack it and as we learn what the letter of the Ephesians says that this grace applies just as much to you and me as it did to the original people who received it about 2,000 years ago. And praise God for that. We can anticipate this grace because Paul was sent to write on our behalf and for us. Here's the second reason. We can anticipate grace because of the identity of the recipients. Not just the role of the writer, but the identity of the recipients, which are this, saints in Christ. Second half of verse one says, he's like, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle, 
And I'm writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. This is who he's writing to, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, when we hear the word saint, sometimes we instantly think that's for someone else. That must be describing another person because I've got a lot of words for myself and saint ain't one of them. This happens to me sometimes like when I, when I fly. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I always get gypped by Southwest Airlines when I check in. You know, sometimes I feel like I will, I will check in 24 hours exactly. Like I'll check in nanoseconds after they open the check-in and they will insult me. They'll be like, eh, B44. And then I have a friend who will check in like 45 minutes before the flight and it's like, oh, A15. And I'm like, what? How, how does this work? But I'll just tell you this. Every time I'm in the airport and they're talking about like the Delta Super Sky Diamond Lounge Platinum member guests, when I hear that, I'm always thinking, ah, that's for somebody else. That ain't me. Even when I'm at the gate and they're like, uh, A-list preferred, you can board now. I'm like, that's for someone else. That ain't for me. Right? Sometimes you hear these titles and you're like, that probably applies to someone and whoever it is, it's not me. And the risk that we have when we come to the letter of the Ephesians is that we would actually hear the word saint and we would think of some like upper echelon of like spiritual elite who have halos around their head and they wear robes and they're like venerated by the historical church. And that is not what Paul means when he says to the saints in Ephesus. And here's what you need to hear this morning. When he says to the saints, he means this, to the Christians. Not, not to the elite, not to the upper echelon, not to those who are better than all the rest of us, just the holy polloi, the, the hubbub, just the normal everyday ho-hum Christians. He's talking about you and me if we are in Christ. He's talking about the saints. You see, the saints, it just means this, it means holy ones. It means the set-apart ones, the sanctified ones. And this is not those who belong in a special class. This is all of those who belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ and therefore have been made holy because they are covered by his righteousness. They are forgiven by his blood. They are sanctified in God's presence. They are declared to be righteous in God's courtroom and they are therefore made to be a holy nation. They are a set-apart people. That is you and me. We are not saints because we earn some level of spiritual enlightenment. We are saints, why? Because we have received the grace of God. Because God has made us to be holy in Christ. Now, how are these saints described? Well, if you look at the second half of this little section here, he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Two things he says there. Number one, he says saints are faithful and saints are in Christ Jesus. They are faithful in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? Well, it means that what it, what it means to be a saint is that you are trusting in Christ and you are united to Christ. This is what makes someone a saint. It's not a religious checklist that you achieve. It is it is the grace of God upon you as you forsake all of your own merit and you wrap the arms of your soul around Jesus and you trust in him. You are faithful. You believe in him. You hear the proclamation of your desperate need because of your rebellion against the holy God. You feel the weight of your own sin and the wrath and hell that you deserve and have earned for what you have done. And then you hear about the provision of Jesus Christ, the substitute and savior who lived a perfect life of obedience to the law of God, who sacrificed himself on the cross, shedding his blood to cover the payment and penalty for our sin. And then who rose from the dead three days later, never to die again, ready to grant the gift of eternal life to anyone from anywhere at any time who would turn to him and what? trust in him by faith would forsake all of their own offerings and say it's jesus or it's nothing i trust in him this is what makes someone a saint that they are faithful and what happens when you place your faith in jesus is that you are united to jesus this is what it means we're going to read about this and study this all throughout the ephesians over and over and over again he is going to say in christ we are in christ now, this is a rich theological concept. 
There's, the Bible describes it in a few different ways. One of the primary ways is in John 15. He talks about the union of the vine and the branches, that you are vitally connected to the Lord Jesus so that the life that courses through him is now shared with you because you are in him. You are united to him. And this is what it means to be a saint. All that is Christ's by merit is mine by faith. And therefore, I can say, not because of my own achievements, but because of his grace, I can say, I am a saint. I am a holy one because of the grace of God. Now, I wouldn't recommend introducing yourself that way, but it is true nonetheless. (laughs) Hi, I'm Nick. I am a holy one. Now, the reason I'm saying this and the reason I've labored this point is because I, I need you to know that the riches of grace that are described in this letter, they are not for someone who is further along the road than you are. They are not for someone who has more memory verses locked down than you. They're not for someone who's been a Christian a lot longer or who is much more well-developed in their sanctification. No matter who you are in this room, this grace is for you. And I'm, I mean that, and here's why I mean it. Because maybe you're in this room and you have no relationship with God whatsoever. You, you walked in here and you know you are far from God. You have not placed your faith in Jesus. You do not trust him and walk with him. The greatest news in all the world is that that all-sufficient sacrifice and resurrection power of Jesus Christ is available to you today. If you would turn from your sin, that's called repentance, and place your faith in Jesus, you could experience the transforming power of this grace right now. It's for you. And if you are a Christian, if you walked in this room for a, as a believer, even if you've walked with him for 50 years, you and I, we need to be constantly reminded and instructed in this grace again. We need to know and see and believe that this grace is for us. It's not for the elite. It's for the everyday sinners who have become saints like you and me. This is for us. Okay, here's the third and final reason we should anticipate grace. Why should we anticipate grace from the letter to the Ephesians? Third and finally, we should anticipate grace because of the content of the letter. The content of the letter, what's in the letter. It's blessings from Christ. Blessings from Christ. Verse 2 says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of starting a meeting with somebody, like somebody called a meeting and you went to attend the meeting, maybe as a one-on-one or like a little group. And you start the meeting and you're unsure of what the purpose or the agenda of the meeting is. And there's like a lot of small talk and then there's a bunch of unrelated items of discussion and the whole time you're kind of trying to figure out like, why are we here in this meeting? And then in like a flurry of activity in the last five minutes, you actually like get to the real point and then the meeting's over and you're like, why did we waste 45 minutes talking about nothing when you clearly just wanted to get to this point at the end of the meeting? That, that, that troubles me. What I love about Paul here is that he's gonna do the polar opposite of that. Paul doesn't want to string you along. He doesn't want to keep you guessing. He doesn't want to keep you waiting. He's not going to wait to do like a card reveal at the end. He's telling you right up front from the very beginning, this is what this letter is going to contain and what it's going to be about. It is grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives his subject, he gives his header right off the bat and delivers to you what you should expect as you read the rest of this letter. And though these words, right, they, they kind of represent Paul's customary greeting to the churches, they are far from a throwaway, right? They're not just like, you know when you write sincerely on an email and you absolutely do not mean that email sincerely? <laughs> if you were being honest, you would write sarcastically, Nick, <laughs> right? You don't actually mean that. Paul actually means this. It's not just a throwaway. This is not just like, oh, this is how I start my letter, so I guess I have to sign it this way. He's saying, grace and peace to you. This is what is going to come to you in this letter and through this letter. As a ministry of the Holy Spirit, you're going to experience grace. You're going to know peace if you receive these blessings from Christ as they're recorded here. 
Grace and peace, these are the traditional Greek and Hebrew greetings of the day. It's charis and shalom. And, and charis, it was the Greek word. It was grace. It was how they would greet each other. And shalom means peace. It's the Hebrew word. It's how Hebrews would greet each other. And Paul is grabbing the best of both worlds and co-opting them for a Christian purpose to now say it's grace and it's peace. And it's from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, he begins with grace. Grace is God's free and unmerited saving work on our behalf. It is the kindness of God that has been bestowed on us, not because of anything in us, but because of God, because of his love, because of his holiness, because of his choice. He gives grace. He gives what we do not deserve and could not earn. And this comes first because this is what God must give me in order for me to know him and to be saved by him. If God doesn't give grace, nobody is in a relationship with him. Nobody knows him. Nobody walks with him. This is what the Bible says over and over again. Romans chapter three says, no one seeks after God. No one wants to know God. No one in their natural state is running after God. Like, oh God, I want to know you. In our natural sinful state, we're all running away from God in rebellion, in flight away from his holiness, and yet he gives grace. He gives what we do not deserve. And this letter, man, does this letter ever overflow with grace. It just gushes from like every line. It's grace upon grace upon grace. We're gonna read in chapter two, for it is by grace you have been saved. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. We're gonna read that in the coming ages, when we get from this life and into the next, if we have been made right with Jesus, it says in the coming ages, he will show to us the immeasurable riches of his grace. Like this letter just is saturated with the kindness of God that is given freely through Jesus Christ. One of the things that that grace produces is it produces peace. Shalom, harmony. This is reconciliation and restoration with God and with other believers. We're, we're, we're given peace. We're not in a state of chaos or war any longer. We are made right with God. We're no longer enemies. We are friends. We're no longer orphans. We are sons and daughters. We have peace with God and peace with one another. And once again, this letter, it just drips with peace. We'll read about how Christ is our peace and he came and preached peace so that you and I might maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And as we put on the armor of God, we are ready to go proclaim the gospel of peace. Peace is all over this letter, grace and peace. And this is like Paul's way of introducing to you what the contents of this letter are going to be. Now, When we think of this idea of blessings from God, blessings from Christ for us, I think way too often we tie those blessings to superficial or material or trivial things, right? We're we're hashtag blessed when we find a great parking spot, when we get a great job, when we score an awesome date, when, when our bank account grows and we're like, oh man, I am so blessed. And it could that be an expression of the blessing of God? Yes, of course, of course it could be. But what we need to fix our minds and hearts on is this reality, that the deepest, the truest, and the greatest of all God's blessings that he has to give. Like if you went into the storeroom of heaven and had the choicest blessings that God could possibly give to you, I promise that grace and peace would be the foremost among them. When God, when God goes into his vast storehouses and he's like, what can I give that's the most valuable, the most precious, the most amazing gift I can give? It's not riches. It's not physical health. It's not anything in this world. It is grace and peace. It is the fact that he saves you through Jesus and makes you right with him. These are the blessings that we need more than anything else in the world. We need grace from God and peace from God. Because if we receive those, it does not matter what we lack in this life. We have that which is most valuable both now and forever with God. We have grace and we have peace. And so as we begin this study, 
this letter to the Ephesians, we should anticipate that grace is coming. We should anticipate that this kind of grace and this kind of peace, that it will mark our lives as God's people. Now, I'm convinced that some of you, some of you, you don't anticipate grace from God for, for one reason or another, because of your experience, because of what you've done, because of what has been done to you, because of poor teaching that you've been given. You, you actually have a, you have a misconstrued conception of God, and so you don't anticipate grace from God. You, you're actually afraid of God. Or you have grown to resent God or to distrust God. Maybe you're skeptical about the intentions of God. Maybe you feel distant or cold or hard-hearted or stagnant in your relationship with God. And maybe even you look to the spiritual horizon in your life and you think like, it's probably not gonna get better than this. It's probably always gonna be this way. I'm probably always gonna suffer this way. It's probably always gonna feel this distant and cold. And right now in this moment, even as you hear me preach about the grace and peace of God, there's a part of your heart that's like, man, not for me. Not me. Like, that, might, that might be nice for all the other people in here who sing really loud and raise their hands, but not me. And I just, I wanna plead with you today. I wanna plead with you to, o- to open your heart, to open your mind, to open your ears as we embark on this study, to, as we already sang today, to take God at his word, that he desires to give grace, that it is actually, it is actually to the praise of his glory that he would lavish his kindness upon you and that you would receive it and be transformed by it. This is what God loves to do. And my eager expectation and prayer is that God will use this letter to help you to anticipate that grace is coming to you from God if you are in Christ Jesus. So whether you're being reminded of that for the thousandth time or whether you are discovering it today for the very first time, I hope and pray that this grace will overwhelm your hearts and will minister to your spirit so that you might praise God for his glorious grace. Spending some time uh, thinking and praying this week um, about a family that's connected to our church. Many of you who are GCU students in the room will know that on August 31st, a young woman named Mackenzie Romine uh, was in a terrible car accident. This was 10 days ago, nine days ago now. She was in a terrible car accident, and for all of those nine days, she was in the hospital with her family. And uh, just a couple of days ago, the neurologist and the doctors agreed that there was no more brain activity, and she she passed away. And as I was thinking about this, and as I was thinking about their family, like this is, Mackenzie actually was not just just a GCU student. Mackenzie was a part of Christ Church. Mackenzie attended very faithfully last year. She was part of our women's Bible study in the fall. She would regularly put in communications cards and have us pray for her. And as I thought about this message, as I thought about this week, as I thought about the Romine family, I was just reminded of the fact that eternity is near for all of us, that we are not promised another day. Mackenzie did not show up to this semester thinking that this was going to be the last days of her life. And yet eternity is bearing down on every single one of us. And what we need more than anything else in the world, what Mackenzie needed, and by God's grace, what she received was God's love and salvation. And we have every reason to believe that Mackenzie is in the presence of the Lord that she knew him by faith, she trusted him, she walked with the Lord Jesus, she had received his grace, and she is with him now. And those who are left behind, her family, her mom Stephanie, her dad Josh, her brother Tyler, they need the sustaining grace of God in these days. They need the grace of God just like we need the grace of God, we who feel the sting of death and who need to know the kindness of a God who sees it all and who loves us. 
And so as we close, I wanted to just take a minute and pray specifically for the Romine family. And so if you would just join your heart with mine, let's pray together.